Good morning, uh, everybody. Welcome to this webinar uh, lecture. I'm um, Jeff Raby, Chair of uh, Viz Asia of the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Viz Asia is um, uh, an independent body within the gallery. I've been established for many, many years uh, to promote the Asian collection uh, and to promote uh, research and, and, and study into uh, Asian art. Um, we're delighted to partner uh, with Sydney University and the Powerhouse Institution Institute in the uh, Sydney Asia Art Series. Um, this also has been going on since 2017. Uh, we've had uh, some dozen uh, significant artists from around the world who have participated uh, in this series. Uh, we think it really adds tremendously to the interest in uh, Asian art in Australia, uh, in Sydney, um, and not just through specialists, but through a wider participating audience. We're very fortunate to have uh, our next presenter uh, in this series, uh, Pro Professor Lisa Claypool. Uh, she will be giving us uh, a lecture, company with slides and, and presentations, of course. Um, and uh, we uh, also are very appreciative to uh, Sydney University uh, China Study Centre and the team there for helping us put this presentation on in this COVID challenge time. Um, so with that, I warmly welcome you again on behalf of Viz Asia at the New South Wales Gallery and look forward to this um, uh, presentation. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Jeff. I will take over. Um, I, I really want to thank Jeff and Viz Asia in particular, um, who's partnered now this year as the fourth series in the Sydney Asian Art Series. Um, and we present from the China Studies Centre, uh, the University of Sydney's Power Institute in partnership also with the Art Gallery of South Wales. Uh, my name is Olivier Krischer. I'm acting director at the China Studies Centre and also convener of the series. And it's a pleasure to welcome you for our first lecture of this year's series, which has uh, been postponed, but happily been able to move online. Um, the series this year is themed art and technology. So it's perhaps apt that I'm talking to you through Zoom and that we're connecting <laughs> also to um, to yesterday, as it were, we're connecting with uh, Dr. Lisa Claypool, who's joining us from the University of Alberta. Um, th firstly, a little bit about the, the theme, and then I'll, I'll introduce Lisa's work. Um, the theme originally was looking at how technology has affected or fashioned visual arts in Asia um, across time, uh, particularly through the modern and contemporary period. How art has in turn represented and in fact embodied sometimes such technologies. And we saw in a way, some of that last night uh, in the screening of a film by Zhao Liang that I'll talk about in, in a moment. We were interested in how Asian artists used and shaped such technologies in the ink paintings of a 1960s coal mine that we'll hear about today uh, to the moving images from contemporary Hong Kong or a photographic archive in South Asia, for example. And even Japanese copper plate reproductions of art in 1880s Shanghai. Um, Today, of course, it all seems, um, as I said, rather timely to be talking about these sorts of mediations uh, via technology of, of our representations of our world and the, the way that artists have creatively uh, intersected in these things. But it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Lisa, whose work uh, I've really admired for many years. Um, as I've been telling her, it's, it's woven, her work is woven between China and Japan the modern to the contemporary ink painting to film and contemporary art. Uh, and she also works between art history and curation. So we have a lot of intersecting interests. So it's a real pleasure to be able to work with her uh, despite the many challenges. And I'd like to firstly thank her uh, for her patience and generosity. Um, she, she's worked very hard to um, not only uh, make this lecture today possible, but also um, it was a great idea of hers to present the screening that we were able to do last night of a film, Zhao Liang's Beer Moth. Um, Lisa teaches and curates Chinese art at the University of Alberta. She writes about science and art, interculturalism and visuality, and exhibitions in modern and contemporary China. Um, she's written, for example, about China's first museum, which was, I think, the first piece of, of work that I read of hers. Um, and then uh, more recently, uh, written a, a lot more about an artist, Chen Shizong, which first drew me to um, some of her scholarship. 
So she's recently completed, completed a book manuscript, which I really um, look forward to seeing published, uh, called Boundary Forms, Design and Science in Modern China. Uh, it's been, uh, but it was while working on her current exhibition project, Eco Art China, that she came to know the artist and filmmaker Zhao Liang. So I'm delighted that she suggested to screen his film, uh, which has such an aesthetic and I would say even political resonance with the topic of her talk today, The Technological Sublime, an ink painter and a coal mine in 1960s China. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks to Libier for that kind introduction. And um, thank you all for joining us uh, this morning. I, I can't see your faces, but I can sense your presence and I look forward to talking with you um, in the question and answer session and then uh, in the debrief after the talk. But in, uh, first I'd like to add my voice to Olivier's in thanking these Asia. Um, I'd like to thank the New South Wales Gallery, the China Studies Center and Power Institute at the University of Sydney. And I'd also very much like to thank Olivier for his amazing uh, skills as an impresario in pulling this event together. And Nick as well for his uh, much needed uh, technical support. And finally, I'd like to um, thank the Canadian Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council for support of this research project. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Treaty 6 territory and respectfully recognize the histories, cultures, and languages of the Métis, First Nations, and Inuit, who, where, whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. Okay, before I get into the paper, I'm going to share my screen now. Let's see. Okay, uh, before I get into the paper, I wanted to talk a little bit about my practice as an art historian curator and my motivations for getting into this particular project. So from the first art history course I ever took, I have been fascinated by the question of how we see and experience paintings and other kinds of art objects and performances. John Berger is famous for saying, uh, that seeing comes before words. And it's that moment of encounter that I am uh, especially interested. How do objects and places encourage us to see in particular ways? And how do our ways of seeing shape how we act in the world? Um, so those are the kinds of questions I posed in my first article that Olivier just mentioned, the one about the uh, the museum, the first domestic museum in Nantong, um, the first domestic chi museum in China, I should say, and uh, and they have and those questions have also informed my more recent wor work about um, intersections of science and the arts. Um, and since moving to Edmonton. Um, and the University of, of Alberta in 2010, I have had reason to think very long and hard about um, the, the ways of seeing the environment around me. I live in a very strange sort of uh, place in, 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 uh, in the province of Alberta. If you travel four uh, hours south, you find yourself in Banff National Park. Here I am in BAMP taking, taking advantage of the tourist free COVID era to get in some more hiking um, and enjoying these in spectacular views of the, of the park. Um, so that's four hours south, but if you go four hours north up to Fort McMurray, um, you find yourself um, encountering the world's most destructive oil operation as National Geographic put it, um, the oil sands in, in Fort McMurray, which are visible from space. Um, and Syncrude is located there and holds, I think, the world's third largest reserves of oil. 
So the question for me is how do I relate these two sort of diametrically or polemically different kinds of landscape together? Then about four years ago, I uh, encountered this painting of the mines that we see on the screen by the artist Fu Baoshi. And the first thing I want to say about him is that he is an absolutely fantastic artist, um, an astounding artist. And I don't think that this painting um, reveals just how amazing he is in his brush performance, but I'm hoping you get a sense of it, um, or a better sense of what I mean by this in, in, this, uh, in this paper. In recent scholarship, Fu uh, generally either is thought of as one of the makers of uh, the communist, of communist ideology, sort of he, that he is contributing to the construction of a kind of prison house of communist ideology, or alternatively, he's trapped within it. Um, but the longer I looked at his paintings, the, the more I, I, it struck me that um, the, the, there's a very dark and almost melancholic quality about them, especially the paintings that he did towards the end of his life. And as I uh, started to look even more carefully into his life, um, the uh, many um, interviews and articles and publications he wrote, um, I discovered some strange things about, um, about his work and about this painting that I'm going to share with you today. And these all disturb that usual um, and expected political interpretation of his work. The question I want to think about is how can this picture of the minds function as an eco-critical provocation. Okay, so let's get into the paper. I have a script um, so that I stay on point in time. So here we are. Okay, towards the end of his life in the late summer of 1961, the artist Hu Bao painted a landscape as it was being mined for coal, strata by strata. The machinery, machinery used to excavate the underbellies of the two mountains, as the artist described them, looms to the left and anchors us to a central position, inviting a panoramic view of the, as the land gives itself up to our situated gaze. Lush, cold, dark lines trail over the surface of the near mountain, bone whites, grays, and pale browns marble the smoothness of the far mountain. Its shadowy surface alchemically matches the smoke from the industrial stacks even further beyond. The yin-yang composition beneath the light sky, half darkly vegetal, half effulgent, yet cast in grays, is shaped by and gives itself up to the human presence of coal miners. The mountains are laid bare by machinery, electricity, and the red coal cars of the Red People's Republic. These are the celebrated Fushun coal mines, one of the five lar largest mining operations in socialist China. And so if we look at this um, advanced primary school textbook, which is entitled uh, um, Our Awesome Motherland. We can see here uh, this in a map of coal mines uh, in China in 1951. Fushun is located just about here. Um, so it's not the largest mine, but because it has the most advanced technology, uh, the most advanced mining technology in China at the time, it's actually featured in this textbook here at, um, at, in this central picture and here as well. Okay. Um, so why did Fu paint them? As he put it, in May 1961, owing to my creative responsibilities, I got an opportunity to travel the Northeast where the mines are located. By creative responsibilities, he means the paintings he was asked to make for the socialist state. So if we look on the screen, Fu Baoshi is, is standing here on the left. To his right is Guan Shang Yue. Um, they are collaborating together to paint the picture we see in situ on the right in the hall of uh, uh, the, the, great, the great hall of the people. 
uh, this land so rich in beauty. And here you can see at the the picture below the in this image below uh, you can see kiss you can see uh, Richard Nixon standing there. Um, anyway, uh, Guan Shanyue. So they collaborated together, and in fact, Guan Shanyue went with. Fu Baoshi on this trip to the Northeast. So they're working together from roughly 1959 to 1961. They're working together very closely. Okay, and they're working for this state. Um, we might put Fu's picture of the mines then down to what historian Judith Shapiro describes as Mao's war against nature. This propaganda poster neatly sums up that battle. So you can see uh, eliminating the last sparrow. You could see the poor little sparrow is being, has just been shot out of the sky. This is part of a, a campaign to eliminate the four pests in, in 5960. Um, the coal mines at Fushun were not the only site Fu visited on this tour of the North, Northeast that demonstrated the power of the state over the land. So here, this is a, a sort of schematic map of his trip. Um, and you can see after he goes to Fushun, um, he actually makes a pit stop in Shenyang, but then goes on to Anshan. Um, and Anshan is famous for its steel production. Okay. Um, in this vein, we could situate the painting within the socialist ethos of art and service of politics. Um, after all, Fushun was celebrated as the people's coal capital, which is the title of this pamphlet that was published in 1955 that we see on the screen. Um, more uh, specifically, we're talking here about art in the surface, service of the technological sublime. Now, by sublime, I mean a thing, something beyond human scale and comprehension that arouses limitless feeling, feelings of awe or terror, yet as the word technological indicates, it is produced by humans. Though in this case, and this is important, it is produced by the new socialist state. The poet Guo Xiaoquan captured the sense of the technological sublime in a poem he wrote during a visit to the Fushun coal mines in February 1961, a few months before Fu arrived there. Um, and if we look at this poem, you see the line that he's, uh, the poet's focusing on the colors of the night sky, the celestial screen of the sky, rows and rows of lamp flames, 10,000 fiery sparks. He asks, could anything else more easily spark poetic feeling? And he concludes this stanza with a line about limitless and deep feeling. And for the poet, this is very deeply connected to the millions of soldiers at the front, to the revolution's battles, to the nation. Okay, so there's no question that Fu would have been aware of the technology Logical sublime. For instance, what about the strange way that the eye is halted at a high elevation I'm looking at this painting? I call it strange because the painting disturbs the classical idea of journeying into a landscape. Uh, Fu's painting of the Jingbo Lake, uh, made a few weeks before he painted the mines at Fushun, shows us how this journey works. So we are somewhere in mid space here, sort of in central mid space. But um, Fu also shows us where he is in the painting. Um, beneath these trees, he's painting, um, you know, uh, he's sketching um, in the flesh, he's, he's there. And we notice these lines that are sort of pointing towards him as if to say, look here, look at the falls with me. Um, but we also can see underneath the trees. We can see underneath these canopies, of the canopy of the branches and the leaves. And we can also float up 
and over the top of the falls to see the water cascading down over the surface of the rock. So this is a floating perspective. It's, it allows us to journey into the landscape. It gives us a kind of perfect freedom. It's one of the, the beautiful things about Chinese painting. But when we, oh, and also I just wanted to show you this detail of the painting to give you a sense of how Fu is working the surface with his ink brush. Um, but when we look at the mines, we cannot make that journey into the, into the image. We can only stand uh, and look at it from a distance um, and look at it, you know, stand there and look at it in awe. But I think there's more to this painting than the politics of the technological sublime. How so? Answering this question, excavating the answer from the painting, I would say, even though that sounds pretty violent, uh, it takes us in two directions. The first is towards the raw face of the naked mountain and Fu's study of geology. This science was central to his drive to see clearly and with scientific accuracy what he called the naked mountain. Fu, Fu lugged geology textbooks with him as he hiked into the mountains. And here we see a photograph of him with uh, one of these geology textbooks. It actually was taken at Changbai Mountain on this particular trip, probably by Guan Shanyue. Uh, here are some of his ink uh, brushes and this this is the case that he carried with him no backpack instead he was carrying the suitcase with him up into the mountains okay so he's there with these geology textbooks and he takes them and he sizes the mountains up he holds the textbooks up to the face of the rock looks at the diagram looks at the land and then looks back to the diagram um, and uh, he's so he he's trying to find what was universal about the landscape and what was universal was to be discovered in the small details at the same time the disappearance of the land beneath those machines at the mines takes us in a direction that would seem to be opposite to scientific universalism into the depths of something more ineffable the fushan coal mines after all are open pits in the earth uh, they're the largest of the pits at the time ran about 6.6 .6 kilometers from east to west, two kilometers from north to south, and was 388 meters deep. There are no mountains there. Or rather, if there are mountains, they were created from the top down by humans carving rock out of the earth. To paint a landscape that is in the process of being transformed into something else and was in some ways invisible, put pressure on the idea of seeing itself. Hence, Spoo's second level of engagement with the landscape was with its depths in the vein of a kind of experiential emotion. By emotion, I mean garden variety attunement to the outside world. It organizes perception and indexes it to other things like memory and the body. I'm not talking about the overblown emotions of revolutionary romanticism, or a deliberate and politically sensitive appreciation for poetic meaning that my colleagues Judy Andrews and Igu have fruitfully discussed in their interpretations of Fu Baosher's painting practice. The kind of emotion I am talking about goes deeper and also is more ordinary. In this case, it emerges from an experience of the minds that was haunted by memories of mountains Fu Baosher had hiked in the past. What I want to explore in some is how Fu's painting of the dusky mountain dissected into terraces by rails, wires, and excavators next to what he already ex call, what he called the already excavated naked mountain offers to us a peculiar kind of eco-critical provocation. The painting registers the awe of the technological sublime, likely as part of his creative responsibilities for the state, but I also want to think about the way the painting mourns the technological sublime because those surfaces and depths to the painting, the near mountain and its naked pair behind it, can also be seen differently through the artist's long-lived practices of looking at the surfaces of landscape that joins his scientific gaze with the depths of inner emotions. So in this paper, first we're gonna look at the sources feeding Fu's 
uh, study of geology and then explore the, the ways that the painting of the mines embody the memories of mountains in an equally perilous environment of wartime Chongqing um, and then at the end meditate on the ways that a radical history of the painting as a performance of the artist's experience as, at, at the mines um, disturbs the usual political interpretation of this art practice. And if we have time, I will also get uh, into Zhao Liang's uh, film a, a little bit. Okay, all right. So Fu Baoshi and geology. One of Fu Baoshi's colleagues recalled that the time he went on the sketching tour to the Northeast, he always carried with him a book about landforms. And he said, to paint landscapes, you ought to start from geomorphology and the science of geology in order to seek the real face of the landscape. A how-to painting manual entitled Landscape Sketching Essentials, or Xie Shan Yao Fa, published four years before he was at the mines, helps us to ground his interest in, sci in science. Its cover design is striking. The credits reveal that the author is Japan's Takashi Mahokai, the editor and translator who dashed off the title with his own brush is Fu Baoshi himself. And I should add that when I say that Fu is the translator, I mean that term very loosely. His Japanese is bad. Um, and there are gaps between the original version and Fu's Chinese translation of it. Some intended, some not. Um, and Fu's voice definitely is very clear in the translation. But before turning to the manual, first, who is Takashi Mahokai? In his translator's preface, uh, Fu writes that when I was in Tokyo, which was in the mid 1930s, researching the brush line of landscape painting, in the descriptions in each book I read there, I encountered bits and passages from Master Takashi Mahokai's landscape sketching essentials and found its arguments meticulous and comprehensive. I soon learned that Master Takashima was a noted forester, geographer, and painter. Um, so Takashima Hokai, we see him seated here on the right. He was born about halfway through the 19th century in Hagi, which is a low-lying delta, um, delta town uh, that was famous for, and it still is famous for its thickly glazed ceramics and for its revolutionary politics. And at age 23, he went underground. He started to work for the Ministry of Industry Bureau of Mines. He also started his lifelong engagement with the science of geology, and he began to study that science and also French with uh, Jean-Francois Soignet, who uh, was a visiting engineer from France. And eventually Takashima goes to Nancy, which we see pictured here below. Um, and he very interestingly is the first Japanese artist in Europe, as far as I know. Um, and he, while he is there in Nancy, he is at, he's studying at the Ecole Nationale des Eaux et Forêts. So he's continuing his studies of, of the sciences. Uh, but he also is now moving into the ambit of Art Nouveau, um, Art Nouveau artists. And this is a painting he did there during his first year in which he's presenting the Japanese landscape um, as if a black and white picture postcard mounted onto gold flecked and chrys chrysanthemum decorated paper. Um, he wanted to learn uh, oil painting from these artists but and designers, but instead he was sort of um, compelled to paint these kinds of very highly decorative uh, uh, pictures of Japan. Um, and here's another detail. Um, so they're very different to the kinds of landscapes that he painted in his sketchbook books privately that were later published in the painting manual. So at the bottom, we see one of these pictures from his sketchbooks. This is its rendition at the top in Fu Baoshi's iteration of the manual and uh, the same here. Now about those pictures in the manual, Fu continues in his introductory preface. This book's core content is its fine sketches of mountains and waters from nine years of geological investigations in Japan and five in Europe, 
talk with an, an analytical framework of sketches of landscape paintings in which using a new perspective, it takes China's texture strokes and deconstructs them. In doing so, Chinese landscape paintings texture stroke is revealed to have a scientific foundation and methods of its practical use are broadened. If I was able to make the manual available in China, then it would add infinitely to new materials for painters. And given how easy it is today to travel, wouldn't it be easy to allow each and every one of China's natural scenes to leap onto a pictorial surface? From Fu Baosher's point of view, the spirit of Takashima's project was to resituate Chinese texture strokes within practices of universal scientific observation. That science is uh, illustrated most explicitly in textbook diagrams of geological strata or volcanic and geyser activity that are interspersed throughout the manual and described in a chapter that has sections entitled Geology, How Mountains and Valleys Are Formed, Igneous Fire-Made Rock, Glacial Water-Formed Cliffs. Okay. Possibly less explicitly, geophysical survey and understanding of the Earth's crust is also present in Takashima's paintings of mountains in Japan and Europe. Pictures from the manual section on Cenozoic landscapes are ordered to represent tertiary and quaternary periods of land formation. By tertiary landforms, Takashima means layers of rock composed of clay, sandstone, magna, um, and volcanic ash that can be found in low-lying terrain are, and are not visible in tall and steep, steep cliffs. Uh, this, is all, this is all information that's included in the manual. That's sort of how it reads. These, Fu loosely translates, only provide painters with the kind of landscapes that can be used in the middle distance. Uh, when sketching the fractured surface of mounds and slopes, artists ought to use folded texture strokes. So this is an example of that kind of gradually ascending mountain range. Um, um, this one in the Soviet Union, it recedes to a level distance, swings low, it hugs the bottom of the picture frame. As for that fourth layer, it is it strictly refers to the level newest earth and there, and quote, there's nothing extraordinary about it that can be discussed. Each of the illustrations in this book, Fu Dots for emphasis in his version of the manual, utilize brush methods that we are used to using and also do not add even the slightest artistic conception. They only imitate nature's embodied bends and curves. So even though he's dwelling on objective ways of seeing in the manual, Fu was keenly aware of the particular face of each mountain the strong local quality, those are his words, of Takashima's illustrations that moved them out of the realm of scientific universalism and that called out to his editorial eye, which is not to say that he went into the manual and reworked Takashima's um, uh, diagrams and, and pictures. He just disregarded what he felt was too local or too specific. And so, for example, this is a, a picture of the Italian volcano Mount Etna, and it wasn't published in Fu's translation, probably uh, because it was rendered not in black and white or in a black, white, and a sort of a dark gray tone, but in these lighter, tone, paler gray tones that lean towards the specificity of a photograph. Of the original manual in favor of generic universality entered into the language of translation as well, just as Fu distanced him, himself from cultural politics by replacing the word Japan with East Asia, he strips names of mountains from Takashima's illustration. So on the left, you can see the Shunta Spitze becomes your. Uh, Europe illustration number 57. And then we see have this French mountain here, it becomes the France illustration number 58. During the trip to uh, the Northeast to get back to that tour, who met with painters at Jilin and described the local landscape, not in the language of texture strokes and aesthetic impressions though, 
but in a way that connected them to other geological formations. So this is what he, this is what he told this group of painters. He said, the elevation of the Changbai Mountains is more than 2,700 meters above sea level. The heavenly pond Tianxi originally was a volcanic crater and the boulders colors are complex and varied. He then goes on to say that in order to bring out the mountain's distinctive qualities, they ought to paint it without stopping as it is our glorious responsibility to express the Changbai Mountain's beauty. So there's a, a bit of a tension there between what in trying to find something universal, trying to find something local. The question though is why? Why take the facticity of the land as ground zero for painting? The manual itself takes up this question. Um, it says halfway through a passage reads, the difference between painting and drafting an approximate appearance, regardless of whether you're looking at East Asian or Western paintings, or just comparing different movements among East Asian painters, is to sum up that painting is the reflection of the creator's thoughts and cognition. It's the expression of the creator's imaginative intelligence. It it is something that is personally moving to the artist and also moves other people. But approximation only demands that there is harmony between the curves and lines and the colors complement each other so that they elicit a sense of ease in the people who look at it. How is it that painters are able to create works that are personally moving and also move others? I think that there is no other way but to take what you feel from your experience of seeing things in the flesh and, exp and express that with brush and ink. So emotions then are not alien to this cognitive activity of sizing a mountain up as a geologist would. They are at the center of experience of being there in the landscape. That much is clear. To convey the experience to a painting's beholders, those experiencing a picture is not to aim for the comfort brought about by balance lines and colors. Emotions are not generated from even structures and harmonious compositions. Such a pictorial composition is about appearances that exist independently of the landscape. What Fu is writing about instead is emotion inspired by nature itself, viewed through a geologist's eyes and rendered by the artist who is not altering the landscape as he paints it. This is not about a kind of bland objectivity though. Another way to put this is that a, pan, a painted landscape as a geological formation will appear to be more convincing as really real if the artist's emotional experience of it is evident in the picture. Okay, so can we better unpack the phrase about emotions? To answer this question takes us in a, this section of the paper on a detour away from Hu Baosher's journey to the northeastern mines and back to southwest Chongqing, where Fu used the phrase about being moved in print for perhaps the first time after he translated it uh, from uh, Takashima Hokai in 1936. So I should add, Fu translated this uh, manual in 1936. It was only published in 1957, many years later. Okay. So, but here, to get back to this phrase about being moved and to think about emotions. Uh, this is from the preface uh, to, uh, that Fu writes to his um, October 1942 exhibition, his very first solo exhibition in, in Chongqing. He says, I think that beauty in the painting, the beauty that is a kind of personal feeling and also moves people, in essence, can't come into existence only through chance. Yet even though a painting's beauty is subject to the painter's technique, the highest function, its highest function still is absolutely not something that technique alone can capture or ability per, perfect. So we've just actually read that in the, in the manual and he's uh, repeating it. He's basically summarizing that section of the manual. But then he goes on to say, for just at that vital instant that the ink becomes wet, the thing that is the brush and the thing that is the paper, it all ends up being impossible to clearly distinguish and prize apart. This isn't mystical, just as Zhuang's story in the outer chapters about the Song painter stripping off his clothes to paint also is not a myth. Okay, a few points are relevant here uh, to understanding 
the artist's experience of seeing the land and that the emotional import of it. First, it is beauty that moves the artist and others. There is something fugitive about beauty, though, something no matter how intentional the artist is when he tries to capture it in ink may, uh, may elude him. Um, that is, beauty is, uh, is always more than technical, technical reproduction of the visible. It can't be reduced to skill with a tool of the brush. Second, the lesson from Zhuangzi is about the naked engagement of the artist with his subject and his ink brush. The story goes that the Lord Song of Yuan invited painters to court. One artist came in with an air of indifference and did not hurry forward. When he had received his instructions and bowed, he did not remain standing. His bearing was leisurely. He was neither in a hurry, nor did he compare, compete with the others, but went straight to his place, took off his robes, and sat there stretching out his legs naked. The artist divests himself not only of his clothes, but of the pressures of time and competing with the crowd. He is indifferent to court ritual and protocol. He is present only to his work. He is his work. The story may recall Fu Baoshu's uh, picture of the inebriated monk Huai Su on display in that same October 1942 exhibition in, in Chongqing. By losing himself through wine, the monk calligrapher became present to the world. And so, um, in, and Fu uh, did many paintings of Huai Su and in them the brush that we see here, this is the painting of Huai Su that was in that exhibition, but the brush is interchangeable with this, uh, with this wine cup. And it's even more complex than this. Um, he says, uh, he's, he's, paintings have their own emotions. They reach out to whoever is looking at them. So this is another passage from the same exhibition preface. He begins, and it, 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 he makes this confession that I am a person who fears encounters with people and my paintings particularly fear encountering people so that if there is a remote possibility, I always take not showing them to others as marvelous. This may be a set phrase, I'm not sure, sure but it gets at this idea, the, this artist's idea that paintings are vulnerable. Um, partly that is because of their very intimate connection to the artist and partly it is because the exhibition takes the paintings out of the realm of being present to what he calls each blade of grass, each tree, each hill, and each valley, and puts them in the public eye in a gallery instead. Fu typically painted with an eye to the area around his house when uh, his family lived in Chongqing, uh, moving the family dining table that served as a studio table from beneath a dangling electric light bulb to the doorway for a better quality of life. Uh, Jing Gang Po is at the center of tens of Li, where I often stroll through reflect, reflected. There are indeed many fine views that words fail to describe fully. Emotions in some provide a unique embodied form of seeing and knowing the natural world. Philosopher Noel Carroll gives us a sense of how this works when he says, Emotions and attention are interrelated in a number of ways. At first, our attention may be drawn to certain aspects of a situation, say, for example, certain threatening aspects. This moves us into an emotional state of fear, or perhaps it is our emotional state of fear that first alerts us to these aspects. However, once in that state, the presiding emotion supplies feedback to our processes of attention. Once alerted to the harmful aspects of the situation, what our fear will impel us to search the situation, to scan the scene for further evidence of harmfulness. And so there's a dark side to all of these stirred emotions for Fu Baoshi when he is in the landscape, um, touched on his desire in the midst of war to paint an atmosphere of, of tr tranquility. Um, Fu uh, so he is in Chongqing. He lived there for eight years. Chongqing, um, during this time, actually before 19, uh, before the London Blitz in 1940-41, Chongqing was the most bombed city on the planet. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about these shadows touching Fu. Um, they're 
darkly rendered in a rare and raw account of his experience in Chongqing, inscribed on a painting that he made for his wife in 1945. And I will read it to you as I show you some pictures of Chongqing uh, that were taken around 1940-42. Uh, and so here you see um, this actually, I think this photograph from uh, taken from a Japanese bomber um, over Chongqing, I think uh, was used as propaganda. Anyway, okay, so back to Fubasher. Today is the 35th birthday of my wife, Shihui. It's been over six years since we moved to Sichuan, and I actually haven't paid too much attention to her birthday. I recall my marriage of 15 years with Shihui. Our first son, Idiao, is 14 years old. Our second son, Iju, is 10 years old. Our eldest daughter is six years old, and our second daughter is just nine months. Though in local custom, she is two years old. With sheer bitter effort, we took refuge in Eastern Sichuan, and my mother-in-law, Madam Lee, came with the family. So they're moving from cent central Nanjing, south central Nanjing, um, and there's there one step ahead of the Japanese military and they it takes them about two years to move from Nanjing and to finally uh, make their way to Chongqing. Okay, during the entire wartime period we have all been extremely agitated. However, I still have not abandoned the painter's brush and ink. Our dwelling is only sufficient for avoiding the wind and rain and we could only rely on what we already had before uh, 1937, in a way similar to when the Yuan Dynasty painter Huang Gongwang found him in dire straits. Fortunately, Shi Hui is able to bear what others cannot bear. Before my daughter Yishan, a baby girl was born at the place where we spent a night in Dong'an, Hunan province. During our journey in the autumn of 1938, as we entered into Sichuan province, she suddenly died in Qijiang County, Sichuan. This was the day after the Japanese madly bombarded Chongqing. Afterwards, we had two daughters, Ishan and Ishan, one after the other. My wife, Shihui, took it upon herself to raise them, and I am deeply grateful to her. In the past, my late mother, Madame Xu, always instructed me and said that once one has children, one will then understand the great virtue of one's parents. However, I was stupid and listened as if I couldn't hear a word, and now I am already the father of many. Encountering such troubled times, everything is unbearable, and to some extent it will be passed on to the future, and this is not at all what I had wanted to make for myself. And then he signs off. Okay, so during the wartime period, we have all been very agitated. Bitterness, the weight of the feeling that life is unbearable, disappointment in himself, disappointment in a life he hadn't imagined for himself. These are the emotions who Baosher was grappling with during the death of his baby daughter and the mad bombardment of Chongqing. The technology of war is ultimately the source of his dark emotions during his sojourn there, and it was deeply connected to the landscape, to his hand and to his ink brush. Indeed, Fu rarely painted landscapes again after he left Chongqing until the last six or seven years of his life. The landscape painting that we see on the screen depicts the terraces of the mountain city of, of Chongqing that he painted in 1942. Um, um, it was called a mountain city. It, it is built on, on the side of a mountain. It's called a Shancheng. Uh, the, the near mountain is in dark, inky, profile against the cloud ring mountains beyond. The blackness of the ink rises up wetly from the bottom. It pools in the terraces dissecting the mountain. It suggests lushness and the wildness of the trees and forest, a kind of isolated and quiet place that encompasses the, this built structure of some sort at the, at the top. Yet the pale paper left bare and the brown tones of ink give a sense of flames wicking up against the dark. It almost seems as if the mountain is on fire. During the war, the terrace landscape where Fu lived and that he responded to, like the mines, was subject to constant bombardment. So perhaps it is not surprising that a, uh, the 
painting of Fushun is so close in composition to the terraced hills of Chongqing. If we look at them, the, the organization of the landscape here, and even this sort of central kind of building at here, very similar to what we see in this painting of Chongqing. If Fu Bao Shi's somber painting the, of the hills around his home stands as a reminder about the pain and complex emotions of being present to the horror of war, the painting of the Fushun mines echoes with those same kinds of emotions. To re retrace our steps, we have explored Fu Bao Shi's fascination with geology and the practices of geological observation as something that sought a kind of immaculate perception of what was universal about a landscape and also encompassed emotional connection to the local beauty of it. Perhaps it is the fact that the mines are a man-made landscape and not one in his textbook that the strictly geological aspect of the Fushun mines in Fu Baosher's painting receives. The represented mines resist the discourse and diagrams of mountain geomorphology who said that he felt extremely frustrated and even mortified by his multiple attempts at, at representing the Fushun mines. This probably because of his usual practices of seeing with the textbook as an aid. But there is a side to geological vision that leaned on Fu's feeling for the landscape and emotions of being there and being present that nonetheless entered into the painting. Those emotions shape ways of seeing the violence of one landscape through the violence of another. Fu Basher's painting of the Fushun Mines is haunted by the wartime landscape of Chongqing. We live in an era in which there is a constant barrage of visual mes messages asking us to forget about the damage we have done to our own landscapes, as Anna Tsing um, and her co-editors um, in a book called The Art of Living on a Damaged Planet. As, as this is how they put it, they write, when humans reshape the landscape, we forget was, what was there before. Ecologists call this forgetting the shifting baseline syndrome. Our newly shaped and ruined landscapes become our new reality. Forgetting in itself remakes landscapes as we privilege some assemblages over others. Yet ghosts remind us, Ghosts point to our forgetting, showing us how living landscapes are imbued with earlier tracks and traces. Ghosts are the things we live with after endings, and we all know what those are. Endings may take the form of the death of a sparrow, the death of a leaf, the death of a city, the death of a friendship, the death of small promises and small stories. Hu Baosher's ghosts may not be our own but his painting stands as a melancholic vision of a landscape that belongs only too painfully to our present and asks us to see through it to the ghosts that lurk there. Okay. Um, so it's a very short coda running time. Um, I just wanted to talk very briefly about uh, Zhao Liang and this film, Behemoth. I hope many of you had a chance to see it. Um, the, uh, yesterday. Zhao Liang is an independent filmmaker and, uh, and an artist. Um, and the thing that I, um, the thing I just sort of briefly want to focus on here, um, and maybe we can talk more about this in the Q&A or even in the debriefing session, I would really like to talk about this film with you. But the thing that I actually wanted to talk about with you is how Zhao Liang himself sees ghosts. So the film it takes us into uh, coal mines in Inner Mongolia. It then moves from the mines into uh, the homes of miners, into smelting yards, into a hospital where black lung is treated, and into a ghost city. And the film is structured on th into three sections, hell, purgatory, and paradise. And it's glossed with words drawn from Dante. And he, Zhao Liang is very interested in the ways of seeing the fragility of the, and connectedness of the human body to its environment, especially when the environment is, especially, is violent and dangerous. Um, yeah. All right, so um, hell, I, I just very briefly take you into hell here. The thing about this, this, um, film, it's very interesting to me, it's often called a documentary, 
but it's not a documentary in the sense that we're sort of inching forward fact by fact. Um, we, there's no linear narrative to this film. Um, rather, I think what Zhao Liang is interested in is, is a kind of vertical interplay between service and depth. And in fact, the first, the first four or five minutes of the film is are just astonishing where we see the, these explosions at the mines um, as they're being blown up, the rock uh, flying into the sky. Um, and we can hear the chords of the, um, of the Tuvan throat singing. And then also see this figure carrying a mirror on his back. Um, and you can hear uh, that this is a, uh, uh, that this, he is carrying a portrait of the dead, right? So it's reflecting the mountains. And here we have very directly this idea of ghosts entering into the, into the film, into the, into the picture. Um, and then he goes on to show us other moments where we get, catch these glimpses of almost an idyllic past. Um, and also this sort of vulnerable naked body um, appears and reappears throughout, of, throughout the film. So these also are ghosts that are haunting the, um, are, are haunting the film. These are the traces of the past that somehow are still lingering in this very harsh, um, this harsh environment. And here, uh, still in hell, he says, I stare at his features baked at, baked as if by molten iron and soaked in sweat. That distressed visage nonetheless does not keep me from seeing clearly the way he looked before. Right? So it's again this idea of like sort of looking beyond behind, looking beyond the surface, seeing something that isn't visible, seeing something that may not be entirely present. Um, in the second section, we, we go into purgatory, which is a hospital where these miners are being treated for black lung and some of the liquid uh, that is around their lungs is being drained uh, from their bodies and um, looks eerily like um, ink. Um, and then that scene close, that purgatory closes with this um, sort of, pictures of this silent protest. Um, and then we move into paradise, which is a ghost city. There is no one there. It is, it is left empty. And again, we hear the Tuvan singing and the behemoth um, here uh, is invisible in the pristine surfaces of the city. Um, and yet its present can be deeply felt. And we see the, the a, a glimpse, we get, catch a glimpse of a, a miner carrying the plant again in the, um, this portrait, this mirrored portrait um, on the back of this, of this figure here. So uh, I welcome your questions and maybe we can start to talk some more about the film. Thanks for your attention. I guess I'm going to turn this over to Olivier. I'm thank, thanks so much, Lisa. I'm going to come back on now. I've posted a, um, a, a sort of prompt, uh, welcome questions um, from our audience. I can see a number of people joining us today who I think will be very interested in your talk. That was fantastic. Um, and unless they take over in the Q&A, then I shall be forced to um, bring all my own questions to, to okay. your talk. I, I thought, I mean, it's just wonderful to see the relationship between these works. But first, going back to um, what I found uh, wonderful, I guess, is the contemporary nature of the sort of discussion of Fubasha's work that you're looking at um, and the way mm -hmm. that that, it's, for me, it's kind of obviously embodied in this relationship between Zhao Liang's work and um, an ink painter. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wondered if you could maybe say a little bit more about your reading of this in Fool's work and particularly the relationship, and here's my bias, um, the relationship that that might have to his experience in Japan. So I thought it was very interesting how you were talking about um, his discussion of, of specific ink brushwork and textured mm -hmm. 
brush and, and like specific techniques as, as you know, in fool's vision, revealing something um, real and truth, you know, sort of, um, you know, factual in, in you know, mm -hmm. appealing to the science that's, of course, taking um, China and, and Japan by storm in terms of its mm -hmm. power, its potent kind of power. Um, and I think that that's something which to me seems to fly in the face of a nostalgic tradition. The idea, you know, the way that nationalisms can make ink painting embody a kind of past. And yet in, in your reading, I see something absolutely contemporary and this, you know, um, is that something that you can talk, is that something that Fool writes more about? I'm not as familiar with his writing. Uh, w writes about... About um, relationship between um, what might be considered traditional ink strokes, um, oh. actually a, a kind of scientific, truthful uh, rendition of, of emotion in the world. Yeah, um, he does, he, well, he writes at length about it. He, this is actually, um, yeah, this is a preoccupation of his, I would say. He does, he, and in fact, the manual itself, there's a lot in there about, um, about different kinds of texture strokes dating back even to the Song Dynasty. Um, and Fu is very, he's an art historical artist. He's very interested in art history. Um, it, even with those poor painters in Jilin who had to listen to him talk about Chang Bai, the elevation of the Chang Bai Mountains, which I kind of find hilarious. Um, he also does talk, you know, like he goes from there, from that to talking about Song Dynasty painting. Like these things are not different. They're, they're not, they're, for him, there's a, there's a deep connection to that. But I also think that his way of looking at the landscape is different, is um, as a geologist, it's not, I think, well, let me see how to break this down. I think there's a tendency to think that if he's looking at this as a scientist, then he's looking at it in a purely objective way. And I think what Fu actually realizes is that to look at this as a scientist, in fact, is to look at it with emotion. So it's not that it's not like science is on one end and then art, is, you know, art and creativity is on the other. That these two things are part; they they belong together. Um, so, and he, he does he writes he writes quite a bit about that. Yes. Mm. Um, I'm I'm going to take the question that's come up on the Q and A, uh, and then I'll, I'll come back with my own. But there's a question here uh, from Tian Nuohang saying, hi, Lisa, I'm wondering if Fu Baoshi had created paintings with similar composition and color tone, like Chongqing and Coal Mine, um, his paintings of Chongqing and the Coal Mine um, throughout his career. So is this, are these subjects oh. he, he came back to? You said that in your talk that he struggled, um, that he yeah. talked about struggling with his subject a little bit. Right, I haven't seen, uh, um, he, I have, I mean, actually, this is an unusual, for me, this was striking, the, 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 this comparison. Um, I haven't seen this in his landscape painting that much. He did paint, his figure paintings were very, um, like, the compositions often were very similar, and he, he, made, he almost painted, sometimes it seems like he almost painted them modularly, but um, in terms of landscape painting, not so much. I mean, in fact, this for me, within his own um, uh, body of work, these two paintings, I think, are very close and um, sort of distinctive and unusual for being uh, similar. I would say, though, that there are paintings. So he did um, a, some paintings of Mao's poems in the late 50s. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of those paintings, actually, the landscape in them are drawn almost directly from the painting manual that I just showed you. So, like, there is some, there is some, con you know, like, modularity there, but not in the way that we see here on the screen. Mm. Yeah. Thank, uh, thank you. Um, I uh, will take another question here from um, Helen Grace. Uh, there's a 
a comment that she loves your talk and the relationship between mm -hmm. the 1942 painting and the 60s coal mine. Um, but can you comment on the relationship uh, between geology, or the relation rather, between geology and geomancy in Chinese painting? She's interested in uh... what point does the geomancy give way to geology in the imagination of the painter? Was that something at play? Um, <sighs> for an artist like Wu Baoshi, or and if not, perhaps different artist? Um, I, that is an excellent question, and, and I don't know. I mean, Fu Baoshi, I don't think that was a, a, a particular interest of his, um, and I can't really speak more generally about that, but that's a very interesting question. Mm. Okay. Um, there's a, do you have some ideas, Olivia? <laughs> Look, you sound I, I like you. I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm interested, I guess I'm interested in what, what you were talking about um, in some ways. Which, and, and this makes me think, of course, of Chen Shizong. So, you know, and other mm -hmm. studies, kind of natural, um, natural history or, you know, natural sciences. Uh, and so that's something that struck me about that generation of artists who did study in Japan is that although there were those who did who studied visual art, often it was other forms of knowledge that sort of um, inspired or that they tried to negotiate through their artwork or you know mm -hmm. in, in the painting painting of that period, which mm -hmm. which um, which I I'm not as familiar in with the paintings of the '60s. So that's one of the things that I thought was interesting is that recently, of course, these artists are attracting a lot of attention in the Chinese art world, you know, once again, oh, yeah. Yeah, you've got yeah, people, yeah. you know, looking back and saying, oh, wow, this is a contemporary, this is a modern, uh, you know, sort of take on ink painting to which now China's also looking back at, which I think is, is telling. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know how much that's, um, you know, to what extent geomancy or these sorts of ideas may come into it. Um, but mm -hmm. just to comment a little bit more from, from Helen, she, she mentions a quote from Benjamin Schwartz saying, uh, built into the system uh, of geomancy, that is, in fact, is the notion that the indwelling spirits of mountains and rivers and the ancestral spirits must continue to be the recipients of the ritual honors, which are their due. Um, the performance oh. of a sacrifice to a mountain spirit may be simultaneously regarded as an act of religious piety, etc., uh, which she comments, it seems so modern. So there's this, you know, there's a relationship there, which I'm not sure if, if somebody in our audience also has, has looked into that, um, artists who may be commenting. There's a couple of other questions coming up. So um, another question um, uh, from Mark of Power Institute is, Fu is an art, if Fu is an art historical painter, is Zhao Liang's Moth the product of an art historical filmmaker, someone aware of ink painting and other still art traditions as he construct, constructed the film? I think that's a great question. And you've probably talked to him more about his, his thoughts on art. I, I've talked to you a little bit about when I met him in Beijing, he was talking about making a, a work about masterpieces um, and actually kept on, you know, asking at the time, you must send me a list of what you consider to be your favorite masterpieces. And I, don't know if, I don't know if he ever did this, but certainly struck me as somebody who kind of had this in mind, but is that something that's come up in your conversations about his current... I I haven't actually talked with him about that, but I am going, so par as part of this um, Eco Art China exhibition in which I'm curating um, some video installations that he has, project he has made uh, that are based on Behemoth. Um, I'm gonna do an interview with him and one of the questions I do wanna ask him is uh, how, what he thinks of the, his, possible impact of his work on his audience is or like how he how how he thinks it might change people's perspective on what they're looking at um, and I think part of that I, I imagine that part of his answer may have something to do with these other paintings because if you look at an image like a still from the from the film like this mm -hmm. it does like it looks like an ink painting and I think mm -hmm. I mean, that's sort of, pr it's present throughout the whole film, right? Even even in the sort of the tragedy of the black lung, um, you know, of treatment at the hospital where those bottles mm. look like they contain, they contain ink 
like that it's just there throughout the film so yeah um, it's interesting that's a great question yeah because last night Sorry. I was put exactly the same thing when I, we were looking at those ink bottles again and I thought, oh yeah, okay. And then just now looking at the, there's a, a scene at the end with this calligraphy of the sort of petitioners and so on. And it's really right. wet. It's like super wet, saturated ink right. to the point where I suddenly thought, hang on, is that, is that ink? Or is that, you know, um, as one might write in the blood of, you know, Right, uh, is, right. Is that actually right. this liquid that's that's being, you know, repurposed, um, and it's certainly suggestive. Yeah. But um, it, this makes me think of um, Mia um, Liu's work about literary aesthetics, the Chinese film. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, a question here. Uh, I might take a, a, a simpler question first because um, we're running short on time. Perhaps simpler. Uh, is uh, how does Fu Baoshi's translated painting manual compare to other artistic training manuals of the 50s? Um, is the translated mm. manual framed in socialist, you know, in terms of socialist artistic values in any way? Did he try to position it in that way? No, he didn't actually. It's a very interesting thing. No, he didn't do that. Um, he, although he is talking about, you know, this history of the texture stroke and China or that, the idea that the Chinese texture stroke is somehow uh, scientific, it has a scientific foundation. And so he is thinking about, you know, our great China in some ways. But in, for example, there's another, I don't know other painting manuals in the 1950s, but I ha have seen one from the 1930s, or maybe it was, it, it's called scientific calligraphy. <laughs> um, and that is very, I mean, so it shows the person, um, it may be the 1940s, I'm not sure. Anyway, he, it shows the person who's actually uh, practicing calligraphy stand, sitting, seated at a table and he is, he is uh, writing the character for Guo, for country. Um, and that, and it, it's not, it's not a socialist ethos, so it must be before, yeah, like early 40s maybe. Um, it's not a socialist ethos, but it's very, certain, very strongly nationalistic. And so that, that kind of tone of, you know, pride in, like, uh, mm -hmm. in the culture and the history, that's very present in Fu's work. But he's not, um, he, he, the language of, like, our awesome mother country is not, is not in that manual. Yeah. I, I wondered about that because, of course, at the time, this discussion, you know, thoughts of how the landscape represents the nation are, are also mm -hmm. quite prevalent. And, you know, mm -hmm. theory, theories about how national character comes from landscape and, and um, you know, climatic conditions and all this sort of thing mm -hmm. was, was certainly prevalent mm -hmm. in Japan as much as elsewhere. Right. So I wondered, yeah. like, I was interested in the fact that, as you described it, 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 there was a certain neutralization, a kind of generalization in the manual um, about right. the landscape. Um, right. I, I'm going to I'm going to actually combine a couple of questions that are about uh, em emotion or about emotion and verisimilitude. So one question asks: Could you talk more about your focus on emotions that are, to quote, deeper and more ordinary? Uh, and then that's one question. And I think that this also connects to uh, another, which is a little bit more specific. Uh, and that asks, could you speak more about the connection to Northern Sung landscape theories? I can just imagine, says, um, says uh, this member of our audience, I can just imagine people like Guo Xi jumping on board with the geological correlation. I'm especially interested uh... in the connection of emotion, qing, and verisimilitude. So two questions about emotion there. So the Fu Baoshi um, famously, as many of you probably know, is talked about as a, um, for his sort of ro revolutionary romanticism and that idea of a romantic feeling about the revolution that he's sort of performing that in his painting. Um, Iku has written this really terrific book mm -hmm. that I think it's called Chinese Ways of Seeing. It just came out. Um, and um, she is talking about the pursuit of a kind of poetic, uh, like a poetic emotion in 
as part of a uh, political um, a political project on the part of artists. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is to think about something that, to, to sort of take Fubasher's emotions, a l like to think about them as um, not so, not something that he's so self-conscious about or so deliberate about, but that are somehow present. And another way of putting this maybe is to say, I initially started this project and anyway, I started, I was thinking about, well, what was, what was his mood when he was painting? Like, what is it? What, let's talk about something that may not be at the level of a marked emotion. That was my first thought. Maybe we can do that. Um, but uh, the problem is that, I mean, that the, who is not talking about, he's not talking about a mood as far as I can tell. He's talking, he is talking about being moved and talking about his emotion. So, but the thing is, he's also, what he's also saying about them is that they're embodied. It's about being present. It's about, you know, and, and sometimes you don't recognize, like, you know, in that whole discussion about chance and uh, technique, he's, he's, almost in a way saying, you know, you have this emotional experience, you may not even recognize what that is at the time, but it will be expressed, um, it will be performed in, uh, in the painting. Um, so I, I just, uh, like, I, I don't know how, I almost feel like what I'm trying to do here is to sort of take, rescue Fu Baosher from this, this, um, this the politics of you know the, both the interpretation and thinking of him just as simply someone who's just you know emotionally bound to the socialist state somehow, um, and to start seeing you know try, trying to understand that more melancholic and dark side to his painting that we see um, in, uh, in towards the end of his life when he starts painting landscapes again, um, and I think. Uh, there's another an anecdote I want to share with you about him. He he went back to Chongqing, I think in the late 50s, 59 maybe, or early 60s. And when he was there, he said, you know, oh, Chongqing, it's so, it's it's developed so much since the eight years uh, when I lived there that I, I don't even recognize it. That's what he said publicly. Privately, he said to a friend, I went back to visit my neighbors and nothing has changed. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, and Igu relates this anecdote in her book, actually, and her conclusion is that this sort of reveals a kind of two, possibly two-faced is the word she used about his um, political commitment. Um, but I think, you know, when you experience, like, think about this, like, he lived in Chongqing for eight years. It was bombed madly constantly. Mm. Uh, he lived in a state of terror and fear. And when you read his writing and look, and especially his inscript, inscriptions on his painting from that, that time, that fear is very present. And there's something very painful about that space and that landscape for him. I think um, so the fact that, you know, uh, he doesn't go back to see his neighbors again you can't simply say that he's, I mean, there, you, know, you can only speculate about why that may have been the case, but um, I think we've all experienced that, pro, you know, that sense of like some, of being in a, in a, you know, in being in pain in a particular place and then mm -hmm. later feeling reluctant to go back to that place. Um, and that, so, uh, yeah, so, that's the kind of emotion that I'm interested in, in sort of finding or not finding. It's, it's actually, I mean, it's so present in his paintings and also in the, you know, in the inscriptions and in his writing about his experience of Chongqing. Um, and I think a little bit of his disappointment with himself at the end of his life. So that's the kind of emotion I'm looking at. Uh, Guo Xi, yeah. Great question. He's right. He's doing these encyclopedic landscapes as well. Um, what was the question about Guoxi, though? What, what? The, the question is about the relationship between um, 
emotion or ting and verisimilitude and yeah right yeah yeah so a connection a conscious kind of connection to northern soul right oh Fu Baosher's connection to northern song painting oh that's an interesting question I actually I can't answer that question I'm sorry there's something to take away. I will mention yeah. because we did mean to share and you're talking a lot about emotion there. And of course you have an article um, titled Fulbash's Sympathetic Ink. And I believe oh, right. that the, the, the phrase sympathetic ink is, is also um, perhaps a work in progress, a book in progress. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. I thought that captures some of what you're, you're talking about and certainly the approach that we've seen today. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there. I, I certainly have more questions, but uh, you've been very generous with your time. Um, and I'd like to thank our audience as well for their patience with our, our technical uh, sort of difficulties getting the, the talk underway. Um, if, I, I think I'll, I'll leave you to, to listen to the virtual applause. Um, I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm sure it's there. But um, thank, you, thank you very much to everyone again for joining us today. And do look online um, for the, the other three lectures in our series on art and technology this year. Uh, many thanks again. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.